Mr. Derek Vienhoff. He's better known as Deke. Drinking liquor with DJ Deke, we out laughing. Yeah, Deke. Yo, yo, yo. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Decast. I'm your host, Decatello. I'm here today with Eric Galindo. Eric, welcome, buddy. Hey, how you doing? Eric is the host of uh, Wild. It's a new podcast available everywhere where podcasts are found. And it features uh, really interesting stories uh, about uh, staying home during the pandemic and sort of how those uh, experiences have shaped people and um, how it's uh, how it's going to be uh, coming out of this pandemic uh, on the other side. So, uh, yeah, why don't you tell us, Eric, a little bit about yourself, your background? Um, of course, you are a writer, journalist and um, producer. Um, what else do you do? And uh, yeah, yeah. So my name is Eric. I'm, I'm actually from Los Angeles. I am a um, Mexican-American redhead. Um, I grew up here in L.A. My parents are both from both both born in a place called uh, Sinaloa, which is a state in Mexico. Um, and they came here in the like in the late 70s. And I was and, you know, I was the first one in my family born here. And and so uh, because of that, it kind of keeps my um, it's sort of colored the way I tell stories and sort of what the kind of stories I want to tell. I, I like telling stories about um, first generation millennials, first generation Zoomers, people that are young and sort of uh, come from different backgrounds that aren't necessarily the the. Um, which you would think is the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, so you're a millennial. So how old are you? I was born in 88. So I'm also a millennial, but. Yeah. Yeah. I was born um, in 83. So oh, I'm cool. a little older. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, so yeah. Like what, what was it like growing up in LA as a millennial? I, I have the Canadian experience, but um, yeah. Like tell us what it was like. Well, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. Cause like, when you grow up sort of the, you know, in, in an immigrant household, I, my, I feel like it's a little different than a lot of, a lot of millennials experiences. Like I didn't have my first computer until I was, um, I don't know, 21. Hmm. Um, we didn't have the internet until I was like 18. So, mm -hmm. or cell phones or any of that stuff. Um, but at the same time, we did kind of, you know, grow up on some of the, the same things that a lot of millennials grew up on in terms of like the culture mm -hmm. um and the neighborhoods i grew up in la were kind of like uh what we call hood so it's like you know very uh mixed income communities with a lot of um gang activity there's a lot of uh, poor people, a lot of middle class people, a lot of uh, black and brown people sort of mixed in together growing up. Um, and so I don't know, I think my, my experience is, is was a little different than what you might expect from millennials and stuff. Um, and I think that that's those are the kinds of people I like talking to, like people that have had, you know, not the same experiences you see on TV all the time. Right. Just kind of like, you know, I feel like millennials get a bad rap in general anyway, like that we're flighty or, yeah, you know, we don't we don't have ambition, things like that. But if if you grew up where I grew up and you didn't have ambition, you'd probably get eaten alive. So I don't know. I feel like right. I have a lot of ambition. Yeah, that makes sense to, to come out of an environment like that. Yeah, you got to have some drive. Yeah, especially if you if like people really can't see me, but I basically look like a like a leprechaun. <laughs> um and if you grow up looking like me in a neighborhood controlled by like the treses, like the gangsters, it just it was always kind of a struggle to like deal with bullies and getting my ass kicked a lot. Um yeah, but it's cool, man. Like I I I I also really love the communities I grew up in. Like, you know if you watch a lot of movies about these kinds of neighborhoods, you will see like a lot of the gang life portrayed, but it's also very beautiful. There's a lot of um, love, a lot of great uh, family stuff, very nice neighborhoods with a lot of amazing, amazing food. 
that that blends cultures from all over the world and creates this like unique sort of LA culture. And, you know, I think that that's why LA has some of the best food around, at least in the United States. Yeah. Like you mentioned those, those hard uh, areas to come out of like the community, the sense of community and family must be um, even just within I- the immigrant um, realm, like that family sense of family is uh, important point coming over from another country, you know, like family is the only thing you have when you first arrive, I'm sure, or uh, other immigrants that are from the same place as you and that kind of thing. But yeah, growing up with those kinds of um, issues surrounding you, that that makes sense that community would be a, uh, you know, a strong factor. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's like sometimes in the hood, shit gets real, but most of the time it's, it's, it's nice. It's like very beautiful and you know, there are struggles that maybe a lot of other communities may not face. Um, like money sometimes can be a problem. Space, mm-hmm. like you, you sort of feel like you're living on top of each other. But there is a lot of a bonding that comes from that, that that creates a very beautiful culture, Also, especially because you're mixing with a d- bunch of different cultures. Like you're miss- mixing with like Mexican culture and Salvadoran culture and Honduran culture and Ethiopian, Nigerian, it becomes just like this sort of incredible like soup of just dope people uh, living together and watching out for each other. Totally. So tell us about uh, the podcast Wild and some of the stories that you've um, heard from people and what are some of the sort of the biggest insights you've had so far? Yeah. So, you know, with Wild, we wanted to tell like for us, it was like the pandemic was sort of a coming of age moment. And we sort of wanted to capture what that means. And especially since a lot of us were, you know, supposedly home where, you know, shelter in place orders, we're trying, we're trying to readjust to life at home and that can feel daunting. But I think also, again, like trying to find beauty in those moments, beauty in the journey in the transformations that were occurring. Um, and so we, we created a show that infused these moments with joy and focused on how resilient we are as people, as humans, and how together we can create these bonds and these communities, even online, even through Zoom rooms, even if like it's just you at home uh, with your parents or you at home becoming a mom for the first time, becoming a dad for the first time. So, so these are the types of people we talk to. We talk to people who ha- are going through these transformations, people who found love during the pandemic, people who broke up during the pandemic, you know, people who had to find out, uh, figure out ways to earn a living during the pandemic. And that's, that's what the show's about. It's 10 stories from the pandemic, 10 coming of age stories infused with joy. Um, but they're not like without they're low low points right it's like a roller coaster which you know these past past year and a half has been and so we try to capture that like the very like the essence of the struggle but also infuse it again with a lot of joy well it's interesting and I, i listened to a bunch of the episodes and i just found it cool because you were caught up so much in the news cycle and the, the stats and the data and the, and the political arguments. And, and that's what sort of like uh, is shoved down our throat every day. And, and a lot of that is important and we do need to focus on that as well. Um, but the personal side of things often gets overlooked. Uh, so it's really interesting that you're able to expose that uh, with a, a bunch of different, very different people with different, uh, different issues and different backgrounds and that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? The headlines can feel like uh, every Sunday I read the physical print New York Times and the physical print LA Times. And today I read them and I was just like, yo, these headlines are fucked up. <laughs> like, I can't. Uh, I was, yeah, no, I was exhausting, trying to get depressed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, but that's not all that's happening. Like, the headlines are big and they, they you know, you should read them and they matter and all the news matters. But there's all this life happening in between those headlines. And sometimes we forget, you know, we're just like, like there's nothing but like the, the slog of like the world feels like it's ending all the time. But I mean, it's felt like that since we were young, right. Since we were little, like, I remember 
Y2K, right? They were yeah, like, yeah, the world's going to end. Y2K is happening. Right. Or like the Aztec calendar said the world would end in 2012. Yeah. Or like the financial crisis. Yeah, and definitely. Yeah. The, the war on terror and 9-11 and just like constant. It was, it's like, I felt, I felt like I was in a video game and I was getting killed. And every time I respond, <laughs> I'd get killed again, you know? Yeah, totally. And I was like, yo, <laughs> I don't want to that's not the experience I want to take from life. Like I want to experience all the moments in between all that yeah, and all the beauty that's there. And so that's what we were trying to capture on wild is like, what, what's the beautiful stuff that's happening between the headlines that nobody's really talking about. Yeah. And, and that's what we, we, you know, we, we did that, I think with, with these 10 stories that we're telling. And so, so far you have about these seven or eight episodes. Is there more coming up or. There's going to be 10 total. So uh, right now, Monday. So we're recording this on a Sunday on Monday. Episode seven will drop and it's about love. It's about dating during the pandemic. And we, we specifically because we felt like we were kind of growing up again during the pandemic, we sort of themed the episodes that way. So like we have an episode about what it means to be at home, which is kind of like like in our mind, it was like, oh, you come you're born, you come from the hospital and you go home you know, and then you meet your mom and you meet your dad. So we've got like an episode on motherhood, an episode on fatherhood. Right. And then you grow up a little and that's, we did an episode with kids and then you have to go and like find a job. So we did an episode on work and then you're out. Then we did an episode on imposter syndrome because I feel like that's, that's a lot of what happens once you do get to work is you're like, all right, I just went to college for all these years or I just like finally got my dream job. Or even if it's a job you don't really want, sometimes you feel like maybe you don't belong there or you start feeling like you're not qualified. And so we did an episode on imposter syndrome. And then and then now we have an episode on love that's coming out. We also have an episode on what it's like to just cope with life in general, you know, how... Um, how much it feels like all our all our old coping mechanisms kind of failed during the pandemic and how we need to like adjust now um and then we have an episode on how like how crazy time feels you know especially when you're talking about like okay the the pandemic is supposedly ending but it's right, like, right, right. <laughs> well, it's, it's like, like a black not, hole. It's like the infinity, or yeah. what they call that, the black hole, where you're going towards it, and it's that's the end of the right, pandemic. Right, right. Like, the the yeah. event horizon. Event right? horizon. Yeah. Yeah, you're in the we're in the event horizon of the pandemic, and we so we 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 have a, a an episode that's like about that, and then we have an episode about letting go, about letting go of all the the pain that happened during the pandemic, and we have those themes are like broad themes. But we're talking, tackling them in like very, very specific stories with people who are stand up comedians, TV writers, actors, photographers, entrepreneurs, um, producers. Like it's all people who have like you would you would expect them to have like the all the answers because of how like successful they are but, they, but nobody's got answers for this shit man it's just true life life isn't a, a test like that it's like we feel like life is a vibe right <laughs> like yeah. i feel like they should update that uh that tupac song it's, it's not me against the world it's me against the vibes like <laughs> yeah like the, the world just takes us where where it wants to take us and then we have to sort of adjust Totally. So what about you personally? Like what are some of the biggest changes that you went through in the pandemic or, uh, you know, what was your personal experience like? Well, I think, you know, one of the things the pandemic made me really do is like slow down. Mm -hmm. I was going, you know, a million miles a minute, um, like working all the time. And during the pandemic, it was like, because work and home became so entwined it like it helped me understand it helped me create like sort of boundaries for myself um and it also kind of slowed my mind down because like my i don't know about you but like sometimes it's hard to shut off my brain especially with all the stimulation that we have yeah 100 like, percent. yeah yeah like phones nintendo switch like <laughs> laptops 
tablets yeah like all this stuff and it was just for me it was just like how do i just stand still and be alone um and like and also made me appreciate things i used to be kind of over like i was over going out to like parties places with people yeah yeah was over traffic oh so over traffic i was Mm -hmm. over like going to the office Mm -hmm. and then like now it's like any chance i get to to actually go and be with other people feels like a cherished moment like it feels like a gift definitely um yeah man It, it just it just changed so much of like how i saw myself and how i was seeing the world at the time um and it, it reminded me of like my childhood, you know, because like when I was a kid, like the streets were unsafe. Um, HIV was running rampant, right? Like right. It, it just and there was a lot of existential dread. And suddenly and like all that, I like as you grow older and like we all became sort of this like we were growing up in this very gilded era of just like excess and I kind of forgot, you know, I kind of forgot that like shit gets real and you kind of have to like for me, it was like you have to come together with the people you love to get through this. And, yeah, totally. And I think that was the biggest kind of takeaway for me was like all the stuff that I went through when, when we were younger, building communities to sort of get through the struggle of like life sort of came in handy and we were able to, we had to do it again. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, a lot of, I've heard that from a lot of people about the slowing down, the world stopping, uh, you know, a lot of people that like, we talk about while well, suicides in certain areas are, are up, uh, I, I'm a little iffy on the data there. I haven't gotten super into that because I think there's also sort of a counterpoint there where a lot of people who had depression and different things from work say, then we're relieving that depression and anxiety. Um, or they were able to clear their mind a bit. Um, and I've heard that anecdotally from a lot of people. So it, it may be sort of a give and take, uh, an up and down there. And maybe not just uh, black and white it could be a gray area. You know? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, you know, this, this is a, the kind of situation that's going to exacerbate problems. Right. And if one of those problems is mental, a mental struggle, or, um, it's, you know, there's, po- it's possible that, that can you know really heighten those feelings of loneliness and and depression um especially like a lot of people were alone right like for me it was a little different because i was with like i live with 12 people so i was with my family and like i was i was kind of aching for alone time you know like that that was for me like i gotta walk i gotta leave i gotta go outside and walk the dogs i gotta go to the park Right. I got to go on a long drive. But for people who are not used to being so lonely, maybe maybe it got a little too lonely. Um, Yeah, it makes sense that people had different experiences. Like what any individual you're going to talk to had a totally different experience from the next. And there may be overlaps, but yeah, they're all. What about you? What was your what was what was your what's been your, your takeaway? Well, for me, I'm one of those people that is changing industries, sort of. I'm going back to university uh, after being in my uh, industry for five or six years, um, making signs as a graphic designer. Um, I, I've been a DJ as well. So the DJing stopped for me, right. uh, of course. And then now gigs are so starting to come back. But then I'm also thinking, you know, I'm not being home gave me that time to think about what I was doing as a career and I want to go back for media and communications and try something a little different. So uh, basically switching paths. Um, That's dope. Yeah. We're also expecting our first kid, uh, me and my fiance. So there's that. Uh, Congratulations. That's thank amazing. You. Thank you. So um, what does that, what does that feel like? What did it feel like to get the news? Uh, it felt amazing. I mean, it, it, it's hard to describe. I'm still uh, in that phase where not sure what to expect, but, you know, f- friends that are parents, whatever, give you good advice and uh, more so just being positive and excited for what's to come. Um, hopefully, yeah. you know, I, I have some other friends that did have kids during the pandemic, right? So you got this pandemic baby uh, phenomenon, yeah. but uh, we talk about the pandemic ending. I mean, I really do hope it ends soon or or we put, we put COVID in its place 
you know, right, such right. that it's it's not a problem for the whole world anymore. Because like the the episode you did on with the kids uh, was very interesting because I do think about that often. Like, what are kids thinking? What are kids going through? And um, you know, their kids are the most resilient. You know, speaking of resilience, uh, you yeah. Know, no, I think that's beautiful. I mean, like, I, I'm so happy for you. I think that that's great. I can see like your face lit up when I came, when we brought it up, when I brought <laughs> yeah, asked you about it. Yeah. So I just feel like that just a very good sign. Yeah, look, I think, you know, I think the kids are going to be so much better than us. Um, I think that they're, they're going to be smarter, more sensitive less sort of controlled by these old ideas that we all kind of grew up with that like the very toxic nature of like the old world men have to be men and women have to be women and you can't right. and you have to like work nine to five and hate your job and if you don't that's why they call it work you know these kinds of like dumb things mm-hmm. that yeah they put on us i think the kids are just not going to have any of that and they're just going to grow up sort of and maybe create new ideas that we haven't even thought of, you know? So um, that's, I'm sure your, your kid is going to be part of that, like that new society of. Yeah. That's that's trip. It's trippy to think about because like, yeah, we can't envision almost what's around the corner. Just like if you look at the last uh, every decade or the past few Mm -hmm. decades, like just how quickly things change and that you could never expect what's uh, what's around the corner um it's going to be so interesting to see that um for sure you know. right like our, our parents didn't expect us to be the way we are no and, and they and you know what they even the technology and stuff people still crap on it and say you know there's too much time in front of screens or this and that blah blah and some of that is true to a degree but a lot of this stuff is technology and tools that that are going to be used to create that next world right whether whether mm-hmm. the boomers or even us millennials like it or not um things are going to change regardless right Uh, exactly i think that's a good point i mean you know they forget that they told them the same thing about television right when the tv came out it was the the same the same when the radio came out it was the same like it's just technology always is kind of scary and and you know there are like it goes to three stages i think i don't know they do this they've done this like study but like there's you know that first stage where it's like new and exciting and then there's that middle stage where you have all these problems and, and kinks you have to work out. And then you have this, this final stage where it just becomes part of life and we, and we find out how to use it. And I think we're entering that final stage when it comes to like, especially the technology that we grew up with, which is like the internet computers, um, you know, mobile computers, stuff like that. Like, I feel like, yeah, what, I don't know. What, what do you think? What do you like? What's the future technology you think? Oh man. I mean, I guess I think about this all the time, but I never have a great answer. But what you just said made me reminded me of the Arab Spring when uh, that was one of the biggest things for me where I'm like, okay, these people are actually using Twitter and Facebook to organize like militias and like resistance against uh, tyranny and different things in in their own countries. Like uh, stuff like moments like that kind of stand out, you know, where uh, or when countries shut off their Internet, for example, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you like, see it cause... happening now in Cuba. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of weird, right? And well, I think I think it's natural, right? Like to be like, well, we don't know what to do with this. We're just gonna we're just gonna play with it for a long time, and then oh wow, now we figured out how to function better by using this technology. I think yeah. the Arab Spring is a great example of that, and also like the you know here in the U S the civil uprising that happened because of George Floyd, like Mm -hmm. one of the things you hear a lot is like, you know, these kinds of, of brutal moments of police brutality against black lives have happened for as long as we can remember. The big difference now is the technology is capturing them. Right. And, and then it's creating reactions that, you don't you just wouldn't get it from just kind of like somebody telling you a story seeing it on video in like almost real time creates a a a brand new way to react you know and i feel like these are kind of these moments where technology has become incredibly useful and not just sort of like inane you know superficial as, as people might say we are 
Definitely. There's uh, this place near me called Marine Land. It's like SeaWorld. Uh, and yeah. uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's, it's, you know, it's been, it's still been open for years. And there's these videos of like the bears, there's videos of the, the whales in captivity and just like not having a good time. And the more it's like, I just wrote a letter to my premier uh, of the province because and I've known about this stuff before. I've never really been like an activist, but you know, seeing more of the videos, you think, you know what, like, we got to put an end to this. Like, so I send a letter, who knows if he's going to read it, whatever, but it's like, it charges people up to do a little more than they might've done without seeing that stuff. I, I mean, it's the power of storytelling, right? Like I feel, you know, I say this a lot, but like statistics don't really do anything. Somebody tells you a statistic, you really don't care. Um, but if somebody tells you a story, like if somebody tells you like 99% of animals in captivity are unhappy you'd be like oh crazy and then you just kind of move on with your day yeah but if they show you one little video of like a sea otter like being kind of sad and all of a sudden you have an emotional reaction and you just kind of activate it to change especially if it has a name you know if the animal has a name and all that yeah and i think it's just like i feel like stories are very powerful And, and i think that's why it's important to kind of what kind of, why what kind of stories we do tell right that's why like for a while it was important for us to be like well we need to sh- we need to like show people images of people who are human and happy and getting through this so it doesn't feel so insurmountable right because like the stuff we were seeing on the news was all like everybody's getting covid everybody's dying yeah everybody's losing their job everybody's depressed um <laughs> and those stories were important stories that needed to be told but it did feel like an overwhelming amount of bad news oh i'm interested in that point and i want to maybe flag that for a second and expand on that because you talked about this uh, at the beginning of the show a little bit so this idea of the ne- the headlines and the news and the, the data and mm-hmm. things being drastic and uh what some on the right may say that some on the left are fear mongering, right? Um, Mm -hmm. These different perspectives of the pandemic. Uh, It's weird because the truth must lie somewhere in the middle, but we have a lot of groups that think one way or the other. And being as we are in this polarized time, Mm -hmm. people get pushed further and further one way or the other. And it's very odd because I think the pandemic is concerning, but we shouldn't be, we shouldn't walk around in fear every day, like, but we should be concerned about right. what is it, what it is and what's going on and the true data behind things. Right. And this is where you have this era now of misinformation and disinformation because people want to um, pin the other side against the wall as, as a, a fear monger or whatever it is. So, so how do we, how do we fight this general, concept of misinformation disinformation um maybe related as it relates to storytelling in that well i i think man that's such a heavy question like i (laughs) i I like to operate from a place of empathy right like i empathize with um individuals trying to change systems has you know when i was growing up i i was you know one of those people who was trying to like change systems and march and protests and all that stuff and all that stuff is really 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 important because these you know the world has changed because of people like that but i also think that there's there's a space for sort of trying to empathize with people like one-on-one you know Mm -hmm. and obviously you're not going to be able to change certain people's minds on certain topics especially if they're extremely on the left or extremely on the right yeah but what you can do is you can create empathy for for people like your neighbors right like i don't know my neighbors politics are um i just know that we all like are trying to keep this block safe or whatever you know for each other yeah um and i also know that like when one of my neighbors um got sick or passed away you know during the pandemic there was we extended empathy to each other right and we didn't have to get into a a shouting match about why they died or if they didn't take covid enough, seriously enough or if mm-hmm. they voted for you know the right or the left 
Like those kinds of questions don't really come up when you're like in life. I feel like that, like, I don't know how to solve it, but I do know that the approach we take on wild is to just tell stories about people instead of trying to think about like ideologies or think about systems or think about statistics and numbers like that. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And I think, you know, humanizing each other is the best thing we can do. And I think that's why storytelling is powerful. Like, you, for example, this is a really, really uh, like superficial example, but nerd culture, right? Nerds were bullied, you know, they were beat up, they were um, harassed. Um, and then suddenly things like Marvel, Star Wars um, became sort of the main pop culture. And they sort of created a safe, a safer, safer place for for nerds right now. Like nerd, everybody wants to be a nerd, right? Yeah, now they're yeah, like, cool again. oh, I'm such a nerd. I'm a nerd. <laughs> yeah. Like you know, I'm a I'm a hot rod nerd. I'm a like football nerd. Like it's become cool, but it's like it changed because of these stories that people were telling. They were telling stories of like outer space right that seem like they have nothing to do with like the nerd at home who's like reading comic books but they made those worlds cool they made sci-fi cool they made fantasy cool and just by doing that they 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 i think they changed the lives of a lot of people who would have otherwise grown up again like marginalized and bullied and beat up that you could you could say the same thing about like the lgbt community with things like um modern family right and how modern family um helped you know people see a gay couple for the first time a gay family for the first time people that don't you know not don't necessarily live in places like la or san francisco or new york or big cities like toronto like they lived in small towns right where mm -hmm. they don't really see anybody that's not like them and I think that that those are the kinds of things we could do. And, you know, in Wild, we can tell you a story about a person who's a who's a father and a son and he loves his kids so much. and You love it. And he just happens to be Cuban-American. Right. Or we can tell you a story about a, a, a woman who's um, has identity issues, which I think is huge for millennials. Right. We all have identity issues. She just happens to be black. You know, she just happens to be Mexican like it's it's just taking these stories that have been that we all know are universal and just plugging in you know people that you haven't seen before in these stories because like dude a lot of the ideas we have about the world come from like disney come from you know the old studio system like so, yeah yeah like go to high school go to college marry your high school sweetheart that's the, the plan. That's, yeah, that's the only plan you can do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, yo, what is that? Like, I don't. I who don't does know, that? I'm, yeah, yeah. Does that? I don't know. Yeah, like it's not. That's not real life. You know, real life is like shit happens and you have to adjust. And if we are a little bit like empathetic about other people's situations and don't just judge them right away and be like, even like, see, like I definitely believe in science right and i believe COVID is real and i believe vaccines are real and everyone should get vaccinated but mm -hmm. when i see a news story about someone who didn't believe in it didn't believe in vaccines and died i don't feel vindicated i don't feel like they deserved it yeah i, I want to ask you about that actually because there's the literally this happened in la is this this story going around about this gentleman who who did that exact thing and of course now right. that becomes a fight now where they're saying that we're people are gloating and this but i don't think yeah. it's gloating i think it's just an important it's it's another important story in this in the timeline of COVID. yeah exactly represents. exactly yeah so i i definitely i'm not for the gloating but what but but you're right it's a story that people it's going to hopefully impact some people who were thinking like, oh, I didn't think this could happen to me. That's that's think, my point. That's my exact point. What you just said. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. And dude, like, here's the, here's the thing, you know, like I was incredibly afraid of COVID. Right. Like in a very, you know, in a way where I thought it was like a death sentence, you mm -hmm. know, even though the numbers statistically don't really point to that. Right. They don't point to it's like it's going to kill you. They're, you know, it could kill you. 
Mm-hmm. There's a there's a bigger chance. There's a big enough chance where we all need to be wary of it. But then um, Donald Trump got sick, mm-hmm. and Donald Trump is not a healthy person. He's mm-hmm. old. He's out of shape. He do- he notoriously does not eat well. He's the president, which means he doesn't sleep well, which means he's really stressed out. Like he's got to be like the unhealthiest person on the planet, right? Like, and he got through it, right? Yeah, he had incredible medical professionals around him and all that. But just that, that like, that moment seeing this guy survive it, like for me, it made me just a little less scared. And I was like, oh, if that guy can get through it, I could probably get through it too. I see. Hmm. And I didn't, it doesn't mean I'm, I, ch- I changed the way I, I behaved or acted, but it definitely made the mental challenge, yeah, the existential dread of it, way less for me. And I think that that right there is another indication of like the power of a story. Like here's just, uh, you know, I can tell you of the, you know, unfortunately of the millions of people who have died from COVID and that seems awful. And it seems like I can be easily one of the millions of people. Right. But if I tell you like a story of one guy who had all the, 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 you know, the things they say you're not supposed to have that can get you killed right. by getting COVID and then he survives. And the fact that my brain automatically is like, Oh, Oh, okay. Like it just shows you how, like as people stories are way more powerful than statistics. Exactly. No, that makes so, sense. So a story about a guy who was like this story that's running around LA is an important story because of that, because hopefully it'll convince a bunch of people to take the vaccination seriously and to seriously consider getting vaccinated and get vaccinated because they're going to read a story instead of just hear about, no, you should get vaccinated because of this. So, you, you know, people yelling at them or people telling them all these statistics, telling them the science, showing them graphs. Like, yo, I've never seen so many graphs. Like, like i felt like i was like in 10th grade honor geography (laughs) geometry again like i'm it's hard like (laughs) yeah it's it's hard to show people the science especially if you're not a doctor or scientist yourself because they'll just say well they they have their own source or that i have my my own scientist which is another thing i think that we need to progress through in the future with science communication is to make it more easily accessible for the average person and digestible um true true because it confuses a lot of people you know i'm I'm not a scientist by training nothing but I, I do pay attention to a lot of the data and I, for me, I curate a list of doctors and scientists that I sort of vet with my own, you know, compass. I, I right. vet and, and I see who are they following as well? Who are they in conjunction with? Who did, what have they published? Those kinds of things. But the average person might not have the time or be, you know, into doing that. So. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very good point. And I also think like, all that is very important, like all that stuff. The the thing about like whatever the power of stories may be, they don't exist in a vacuum, right? They, we still need the science. We still need the doctors. We still need these people who are coming up with the, the, the actual right solutions and plans and strategies. But I do think in order to sort of change someone's mind, mm-hmm. it needs to be a story that feels very personal to them, especially if they're deeply in, in, entrenched in their beliefs um, and have become sort of like they have to choose a side like i either have to be this or i have to be that which is a false like that's you know that that that's a false dichotomy right false choice yeah mm-hmm. yeah there's no we aren't talking about sides here right so we're just you well know, yeah that, just, and that that's the, the craziest thing about the pandemic to me is that um a virus shouldn't really be political but it's become no. political because we're so political. The whole world is so. Yeah. Political, so. No, I agree. You're right. I think it's it's silly. Um, it's like like if polio had you know representatives. Like I don't understand it. Yeah. yeah. At all. Um, but I also think like the the so far the solutions have been to like yell louder, right? Yeah. To be like no this is science and that has not worked. So I think honestly, maybe, I don't know, man, I don't know what's, what's going to have to take. Maybe it's going to have to be fear. Maybe it's going to have to be, 
Honestly, I, I have a prediction, and yeah, yeah, tell me. What I, I do is. think that the, although so the the rest of the people who have not been vaccinated yet, there's obviously different camps. There's different thoughts and and bubbles, um, different reasons, and so there may be different approaches. But um, I do think you're seeing the do- a domino effect around the world where sort of immunization records prove to be involved in certain public activities may become more of a thing. And I know that's fraught with controversy, especially in the United States, but um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if something like a mandatory vaccine or uh, if private business, more and more private uh, institutions and businesses and schools start requiring it. Um, obviously in the States you have the constitution and people are always going to hold up the constitution to defend themselves from something. Mm-hmm. But uh, when it comes to, you know, a pandemic, because if we want to talk about data, you know, in, in LA, for example, uh, it's like just over 2000 now, 2200, the seven day average, whereas a month ago was 100 or 200 cases. Mm-hmm. Now we know that a lot of people are vaccinated. So the deaths hopefully won't be as bad. But depending on how the next few months go, it's kind of interesting because you might see that you have countries like Italy, France, Denmark, uh, places like that that are requiring this. So it, it, it might be one of those things that is taken away from our sort of personal choice and it just becomes a thing you got to do yeah american individualism is such a character such a caricature yeah of like um it's like yeah i feel like people they hang on to the wrong thing you know because they could be like you're, you're taking away my choice my individual choice but they want to be so individual but then they want to like follow trends and be like everyone else and have acceptance right and be like no i'm just like you don't you see and everyone agrees with me like all these people who are like fighting for their individualism are often you can tell they really want everyone to agree with them which seems counterintuitive to be like I'm a, I'm the lone ranger now follow me. Like that's, that's, that's crazy to me. And I think it's, it's, it's false. Like, I don't, I don't know why Americans, America like developed this idea of like, we have to be alone individual and by ourselves Mm -hmm. when historically America is a community, right? Like it's a, it's, it's a country built by community built by corporations which are definitely not individuals like stuff like that so i don't know where the myth of the american individuality individualism whatever it comes from like yeah you're you're an individual person you're a unique person and you have your story and you have your life you have rights you have have rights yes but as far as like the america was not built by individualists like america was built on the backs of you know black and brown immigrants and that's it like there was no it's a myth to think that the america the the american dream is about being by yourself or whatever Mm -hmm. um so i don't know i think i but but because of this myth the government has always been hesitant to impose any kind of restrictions to personal choice um yes and, and, and i don't think funny. this yeah. is the rubicon or whatever you call it, the recrossing though right because that the politics of libertarianism or individualism butts up against the concept of community and the concept right. of the pandemic and and we have a certain right superseding another right and this exactly. is where people get caught up and they say no individualism all the way can't be anything else my body my choice but it doesn't become your body, your choice when it's a virus that transmits between humans. And it seems like a simple concept, but I understand that a lot of people have a strong feeling about that. And it doesn't really. No. Tell. Yeah. I mean, even the mask, right. They don't want to wear the mask. Um, I, I don't either. Look, I don't want to wear it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to wear the mask either, but I mean, it, it also doesn't seem like a big deal. Right. It's like, if everybody was like, if someone was like, gotta wear a hat, like if they were like, look, if you don't wear a hat, your cell phone's going to give you cancer in the brain. Right. right? And I think, like, I'd wear a hat, you know? I don't know. I don't want to wear a hat, but I wear a hat. Like, that to me is as simple as that. Um, and I think same thing with, like, a seatbelt, right? Like, yeah, the chances of you getting into a car accident aren't that high. But if I get into a car accident, I want to be wearing a seatbelt. And it's yeah. as simple as that. But I think, I, I think it's going to be a combination of, like, the government 
and and corporations who are motivated by money right and if the pandemic continues to go on if people continue to refuse vac- vaccinations the these companies are going to lose money right yes and this is what you hear about with fox news now because you have sean hannity for example coming out pro vaccine or or putting an exclamation mark on that and you have for example, the mm-hmm. governor of say alabama has come out pro, pro vaccine because and i I don't know how much of this is true, but I, I know that, say, Republicans, there's about 30 percent that are hesitant or anti-vaccine and Democrats, it's more like two, three percent. And so possibly coming up next, we have sort of the virus infiltrating a lot of red counties, for example, more so mm-hmm. because of the vaccination differences. And so maybe there is something to that why a lot of Republicans perhaps are now knowing someone who got it or. Uh, or, but back to the money issue too. Maybe a lot of corporations. Um, yeah, really- I think it's going to be a combination of. Mm-hmm. There's going to be some sort of government. There's going to have to be government intervention at some point. I think, especially when you're talking about schools, yeah. kids going back to school. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like to me, you're right. This makes this makes no sense. Like none of it makes any sense to me. It's like, I would I would imagine. If you're somebody who thinks you have all these rights as an American, like the first right you should have is to this vaccine. You should have been like, yo, the government, my government paid for this vaccine. That's my money. It's a state of the art vaccine. I'm going to go get it like it's the new iPhone. You know, that's that's what that's. Yeah, that to me seems like logically if you're a patriot, if you believe in America first. That yeah. you would be like on that line, first in line, trying to get that vaccine because it's American, it's American made. It's like all these things, right? All these things that you supposedly stand for. Mm-hmm. And, and to all, me, like, yeah. I think a lot of it is like, you're not going to get the vaccine because you refuse to believe in like being weak, which is dumb. You know, so I don't I don't really know where this, there's 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 so much like psychology. And yeah, it's philosophy it's, to it. Yes, definitely. And it's cultural. Right. Because we talk about uh, other other nations are dying, literally dying for the vaccines like they they would kill to have them. And uh, we're, we're in places they don't. And we're just refusing them. Um, right. You know, and like you said about empathy, that I, I want to be empathetic to, to people and, and their their viewpoints. And I do think you're right that that is like a pathway to figuring things out. You can't just yell louder at each other. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm personally trying to learn that as I go as well and better myself in that area, because I can be very argumentative. And a lot of this podcast has been that debates and stuff like that. But uh, I think you're right. Uh, that's the storytelling and the empathy is, is a ticket out, but, but we do need people to sort of check themselves, check, check their beliefs and make sure you're not contradicting yourself with your own viewpoints and your stance. Yeah. Yeah. Also, you know, I feel like, like, just be like, you don't even have have to tell anyone right just go get the vaccine on the low no one has to know you can can still be on twitter tweeting about how you hate the the left and perhaps a lot of them already are doing that a lot of these talking heads maybe i did get the vaccine and they're they're you know yo the every single representative for government got the vaccine like that's the crazy part right like if you're a a republican or a democrat and like 99.9% 99.9% of those people are all vaccinated, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, including like Ted Cruz, including Sean Hannity, including all of them. There's so like now like public facing, whatever they were saying publicly, like, you know, they were all vaccinated because they guess what? They don't want to die. They don't want to die over being no. wrong. No, and exactly. to me, it's like it's you're taking a massive gamble for no reason because it's like what? Maybe you're maybe you're maybe you're right. Maybe you don't need the vaccine. Maybe you can survive COVID. But why gamble? Right. Like, that's the why thing. Risk it's that? risk risk assessment. And the, the, the calculations are not being done correctly. But that's a great point that a lot of these officials, uh, you know, probably are or, or proven to be are even Brett Weinstein, for example, who's been sort of chastised lately for having a lot of misinformation on his, on his podcast. He I believe he's vaccinated. And, um, you know, so. Um, yeah, Putin, blame it on Putin said, uh, he, Putin said he was vaccinated because I'm the head of the army. You know, of course we're vaccinated. What are you, of course he's you vaccinated. Mean? Yeah, it's, I mean, and he believes in Russian technology, right? Yeah. That to me is like this is American. This is like top of the line American technology. 
we got it first. We got it the best. It's like, I don't understand the hesitancy really. Yeah. And, and we're kind of lucky up here in Canada. We have now 80% with one shot and we're looking at to hit 80% with two, I think within a month or so, like for the whole so, country, for the whole country, man, like <laughs> we're, we're killing it. Wow. Like we're killing it. And I don't, I, I don't mean to gloat either because it's no, but uh, that's beautiful. I mean, I great. love that. It's great, yeah. but we still have the frustrations, right? We still have the similar ideologies that are creeping through in the protests, different things, but it's to a lesser degree. But we all, you know, we have family in the States, you know, people in the States have family here. They want to come over, vice versa. So, you know, yeah, no, I think that, that that's amazing. I mean, that, it, it, considering like how, how you can't give it to certain age groups, yeah. 80% is very Yeah, I believe 80% to of 12 up. So that's... I think that's yeah. the stat right now, which is amazing. But like you said, that's amazing. Like, yeah. I mean, even in L.A., we're only at 50 percent. So it's it's not great, man. And uh, we yeah. do, we hope it gets better. And uh, we, we hope the numbers, uh, you know, we don't want to jinx it here with the with the pandemic ending. But uh, no, I think it's going to end. I think it's going to end. I think, you know, I think we're in that nebulous place, the event horizon of. Yeah. Right before it ends. Um it's like in the movies right like when, when you, it's like in a horror movie or or like a, when you got the you got the monster on the floor and you think it's dead and it's gonna take one last shot at you and yes. i feel like that's where we're you know we got our backs to, we turned our backs to it and it took another shot at us and i think we just have to like put it out of its misery for good it's true man and you know this topic we could go on for days and days and days on the pandemic but uh eric it's been like so cool to get to meet you and talk to you about the show i'm gonna keep listening uh for everybody it's called wild and you can get it most anywhere you can get podcasts uh so we're really looking forward to the rest of the episodes and uh what you got next in the future so can you plug yourself like where can people follow you and all that yeah if you want to follow me you can follow me at eric galindo on instagram or at eric g with three e's on twitter um yeah please you know listen to the show tell us what you think you can go on itunes and leave a review even if you don't like it <laughs> even if you don't like me let us know what's up um thank you Dee can tell for having me i this was a great time great way to spend a sunday sunday afternoon here in la yeah man no problem uh, maybe we'll have you on again another day uh, looking forward to it thank you man thank you okay take care all the best man you too